It's that time again where a major football tournament is about to start. The UEFA European Football Championship will kick off on June 14th with the first match between host of this tournament Germany and Scotland. It's also the time where colleagues and friends start talking you into participating in various types of fantasy leagues to predict the outcome of that tournament. In this video I want to focus on a way to try and increase your chances to win the term tournament by predicting its outcome. This video will focus on a rather alternative approach. I came across this article where someone predicted the outcomes of the last two tournaments, I believe, using graph theory, so just focusing on the relationships between the different club teams that send players to various national teams on therefore determining the strengths of the different national teams and then applying that to the tournament bracket. The workflow I want to show you today applies a similar methodology, slightly varied compared to what was shown in the article. However, we will end up with a prediction on the group stage, a prediction on the full bracket, and a prediction on who will be crowned the champion. Before diving into the detailed workflow, let's understand the concept. First, we're going to extract the relevant data from Wikipedia. So that is A, Z, squads of all national teams, so that we can build a network graph that shows how many players each club sends to which national teams, and B, the data of all the matchups across the group stage and the main road of the Euro 2024. After that, we will use the uh, club and team data to create a network graph. This network graph will show all the connections between the different clubs and the teams that they are sending player to. After that, you run a network analysis, and this comes bit out of the box into NIME, into one of the extensions. And one of the metrics that we get out of that is a so-called authority score. Without going into all the mathematical details, the authority score is like a strength rating for a national football team. It shows which teams are considered stronger based on the number of players top clubs send to them. High authority score means a team has more players from well-known clubs, making them likely to perform better in matches. We then use the authority score to rank the teams in order, and then we apply this ranking to every single matchup to simulate the entire tournament and to determine the winner. This is not going to be a full tutorial on how to build this workflow, but I have commented extensively in the workflow, so if you want to follow along, you can download it and see for yourself. However, I will be highlighting some key functionalities and we will now get started with looking at the data that I've gathered and how I've pre-processed that. In general, I've used two Wikipedia pages. One of them shows an overview of the players nominated for each country and also has the important information which club they are playing for during the enormous season. That is the data that I will be using to generate the network graphs, which will tell us which are the strongest teams. The second page is all about the matches and the different stages. It contains an overview of the group stage of all the matches. It includes also the logic for the tiebreaker, which will determine which third place teams in their group will advance to the main tournament bracket. It did include this main tournament bracket, including all the information that we need to understand how the pairings of teams will work out. The first part of my workflow deals with data extraction. The upper node fetches the teams the squads and the clubs, and the bottom node extracts the matches, the schedules, and splits them into the groups, round of 16, and so on and so forth. Let's now zoom in into the meta node that fetches the team data. We first pass the URL into the web page retrieval, and after that pass the XML data that we get back into a range of XPath nodes and loops to extract the data that we really need. 
but how do we know what we need to extract using the XPath node? In that right click and inspect the header, which shows the country of the national team. We can see that the country name is wrapped into an H3 tag. If we keep hovering over, you can also see that the player and club data is wrapped in a table. So that's why we will grab this data using an XPath node. The first XPath node adds two columns, one for the teams and one for the country. The query for the team is slash slash table, as we saw that the teams are all in a HTML table, and for the country it's slash slash h3. For both new columns we specify that for every element that is found we want to see that in a separate row, and for the teams we specify the node type format, that means we get the table as a new XML, that means we can later on also manipulate and extract all the columns and the rows in the table. For the H3 tag, we do the same on the multiple rows, but we choose the type string as we just want the name of the country. The second XPath node takes that table in XML and extracts the different rows simply with the XPath query slash slash tr and the type is node again and multiple rows. If we inspect the output table at the bottom, we will notice that at some stage there are not countries in the country column anymore, but other H3 headings, so we want to remove some. That's why we add next a row filter and we exclude rows after a certain row number. This for now we have to do manually. At the time of this recording, the finest words have not yet been announced, so Wikipedia certainly is going to change. That means if you run this workflow by yourself, this is a spot you will certainly have to check. The row splitter node next cuts the table in half. To the upper port go all the rows, so everything other than the first row, and to the bottom port goes the first row, as this only includes the headers. Next, the workflow splits into two branches, where we extract the contents of the different rows so that we have all the values in a separate column. In the bottom part, we process the header rows where we just need the XPath node to extract the content of the th tag, and we select string as type and spread it across multiple columns. In the top, we perform the same action, however the tag for the different roles is a TT tag, and we are processing this within a loop. In the top part, there is an a column filter which removes the column called iteration which is automatically created by the loop nodes. And after that, in both branches, we add a table transposer to turn the table on its side, then we reset the row IDs to make sure that they align before we flip it back. That makes sure that the column names of both parts align, and after that we can easily stitch it back together using their concatenate node. With everything now in one table again, we do some final processing. First, we use a column filter to remove any columns other than the country and the club. After that, we do some column renaming to make it easier to understand what data we have before we add the string manipulation node to remove the edit part that is currently behind each country. Then we filter out the first row which currently contains the header, use a missing value node to remove any rows that contain missing values, and last but not least we use a column expressions node to simply append a new column that for every row has a value of 1. That way it's going to be easier to group them and get them later on. Now let's zoom up again into the main workflow and see what's up next. First, I'm saving the output of the table that we've just generated as a .table file to the current workflow data area. That is just to make sure that going forward I can also replicate this, because the lineups, as already mentioned, will change. 
the deadline is actually on the 7th of June by midnight. So over the weekend, hopefully, I will be able to compile a final simulation. Further down are two additional meter nodes. One is used to extract the match schedules, and the other one is to extract the logic for the third place tiebreakers, so that we can understand which teams will advance to the main stage after the group stage has been simulated. It's both nodes apply similar techniques to what I just explained in depth, or we not cover it the exact same way. However, let's take a quick dive into the Extract Match Schedules node to understand how we can use XPath to find elements in an XML based on certain attributes and classes. If you follow the URL of the second web page retriever and then scroll down a fair bit, at some stage you will find the section where not only the groups that were drawn are shown, but also all the match schedules. If you right click on the row of the first match and select inspect, you will find that each match is wrapped into the stiff with the attributes item scope, item type equals a certain URL, and there's a certain class assigned to that. If I collapse this and I hover over the next one, you can see that the second match gets selected and so on and so forth. So this time around, we want to select all diffs that have item scope, a certain item type, and a certain class assigned to them. That should give us all the matches. Let's now go back to the main workflow and see how we can turn what we just learned into an XPath query. Let's open up the configuration menu of the first XPath node, and after that, click on the edit button for the only existing XPath query. This is certainly a more complex query, so let's walk through that step by step. We start with the double slash div to make sure that we search for all the divs. After that, we add square brackets, and in these brackets, we can now define our search criteria for any attribute that we saw, so that is item scope and item type. We can search for them by adding an add symbol before them. So add item scope at item type equals, and then in quotation marks, the exact URL that we have seen. And then we connect the two using the keyword end. After that, we can add another end and search for a class that contains football box. That is being done by using the contains function. In brackets after that, we again say add class and then in quotation marks, football box. This will return all the matches. The second XPath node contains a simple query to break up the data into different columns, as you can see at the bottom. And after that, there's some additional data wrangling, including a lot of uh, splitting the table, uh, which is meant to break up the data into the different rounds. Now that we've pre-processed and extracted all the data that we need, let's shift the focus to the network analysis on the squad data table. In this meta node, there are some things going on in parallel. To start with, we use the table reader node, read the table of the squad data that we have saved earlier. We then pre-process it a little bit, before we create our network with that data. We send it on the one hand to a network analyzer to get the authority scores that we introduced earlier. And on the other hand, we extract certain properties that are useful to make the visualization a bit nicer. For our network, we want to know how many players different clubs send to different national teams. That's why in the group by node, we select the columns country and club as group columns, and in the manual aggregation tab, we select the count column and use the aggregation method count. After that, we use the column expressions node to start defining the connections between the different clubs and the different countries. We add a column that is named edge ID, where we join the column club and the column country together using a separator. The next node is called object inserter. 
it gets as an input our table from the column expressions node, which contains now a column for club, a column for country. Those will all be nodes in a one network. Then a column named edge, which redefines a connection so the lines between the different nodes and a column count, which represents the number of players that a club is sending to a national team. The other input port comes from the network creator node. But we not show the config here because you literally can drag it on the canvas and execute it without having to really configure it. It's a little bit different for the object in Zota node. If we look in the configuration dialog, we will have to select the nodes on each end of an edge. So that means the node ID column is a club and the second node ID column is a country. For each of them, we also define the label column, which is a text that we want to show on each node. So it's going to be the same club for club and country for country. On the edge settings, we select the edge ID column and then make sure that we tick the create directed address so that it's not a two-way street, but a one-way street from club to country. In the weight settings column, we select count as a weight column. Next comes a very key node, the network analyzer. This is a node that will give us the authority score that we can then use to define which are the strongest teams based on the connections within the network. In the configuration dialogs, there are a lot of settings. I've ticked them all, but the most important one is a box on the node analyzer for hubs and authority. This will make sure that the authority score is being calculated. The output table contains a column object ID. If you remember, then we defined that a node is either a country or a club. So the object ID shows all the nodes, which means all the clubs and all the countries. Each node, there is also the authority score calculated. The most important, and therefore for our use case, the strongest team has an authority score of 1. Every other team will have a score below that. Given that we decided to go for directed address, most of the clubs will have an authority score of 0, and only the countries will have an authority score. That's why next we are going to use a sorter node to sort by authority score descending, and after that we pass the data to a row filter, where we only keep the top 24 rows, which are the 24 countries that play in the Euro 2024. After that, we add a column expressions node, where we add a column named rank, and using the row index formula, we simply insert the current row position as a number. That gives us a ranking in the order strongest to weakest. And let's now look into the other branch that comes out of the network analyzer. To start with, we send the output table into a size manager. In the size manager, we can extract a column that defines how large the different nodes are. We will use the authority score column de to determine the size, and we will add a scaling factor of 45 and keep everything as standard. After that, we use a visualization property extractor node to extract the newly appended column named scaling factor as a visualization property so that we can use it later on in a feature inserter. The next feature that we want to extract is a color. We use a color manager node and select the appended column scaling factor, which means that we can define a color range the minimum value is 1 and the maximum, as we've defined it in the previous node, is 45. So the nodes with the lowest value will be shown red in our graph, and the nodes with the maximum value of 45 will be green. We then use another visualization property extractor node to extract this generated property and append it as a column to our data table. This is then also sent to another feature and set later on. Let's now take a look at the feature inserters. We will take a look at the second and the third feature inserter. The first one is the same as the second pretty much when it comes to its configuration. So first we want to insert the feature of color and attach it to the notes. We look at the configuration dialog 
in the ID settings, we can either define an edge ID, so that would be the connection between two nodes, or we can define a node ID column, which is an individual node. In our case, the node ID column is the object ID, and that's what we need because we want to assign the color to a node and not to a connection between nodes. In the feature settings column, it's important that we assign a name, in this case color, to the feature and then define from which column in the data table this feature should be derived. This is also color. The last feature inserts are labeled in that edge player count is a little bit different in that the input table comes straight from our column expressions at the beginning and doesn't go the side way uh, through a size manager, color manager, or any other type of manager. The reason for that is that we want to create a label that we can show on the different edges. So let's say there's club A sending five players to national team B, then we want to show the number five on that connection. So this value is already available in the count column in the column expressions table. And the table also contains the edge IDs which we've created in that column expressions table. If we look at the configuration dialog, the main difference is that under the ID settings, we're not choosing a node ID, but an edge ID column, which we've created. And after that, it is pretty much the same. We assign a name to the feature, its edge player count, and define where the value comes from. That is a count column from the table. Let's now move back up in the workflow to see what we do with the outputs, which is A, the network table, and B, the data table that includes the ranking of all the 24 teams that have qualified based on the authority score. Let's start with the network viewer. That is a node that we send that green square output port to, which contains all the information about our network. If we look into the configurations tab, under general, there's not really much that we have to do. However, under layout settings at the very top, we can choose a default layout. I've decided to go for coals as that seemed to be the nicest representation of our network. And then in the node and in the edge settings, we need to decide where we want to show the different features that we've created. For example, under node settings in the label section, we go for the label column, which is just the name of each of the teams and the clubs. And further down under representation, we use the color feature under node color and node outline color. And we use a size feature under node size feature. We can also decide for a shape. Here I've decided to go for a default shape, which is a circle. Under edge settings, the same applies. You may remember the edge player count feature that we've inserted last in the meta node. We use this as a label feature. Let's now take a look at what the network graph looks like. In order to remain spoiler free, I have deactivated the labels for the different nodes. So, if you look at this graph, you can notice that there are many larger circuits of different colors, and there are four in particular that are larger than the others and greener than the others. So these will very likely be the favorite teams for the Euro 2024 based on the network analysis. We will reveal at the end which teams these really are. At the other end of all the different lines that connect to these larger loads are very small red dots. So these are all the different clubs that don't really have any weight and are very unimportant in the network analysis when it comes to their authority score. On each of the different lines, you can see the label so that indicates how many players this club has sent to a certain national team. Let's now go back up in the workflow and let's check out where the bottom table goes that contains the rankings of the different countries in the context of this network analysis. It goes to the section where we simulate the tournament. There are a couple of meta nodes, at least one per each of the rounds, so that is group stage, round of 16, quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. And I will skip the detail for that, as this contains 
primarily joiner nodes to join in the teams into the match schedule, con expression nodes to compare the ranks of the opposing teams to determine the winner. And then we pass the uh, evaluated table down to the next round where the same happens again. Long story short, at the very end we run the final where only two teams remain. And as you can notice, every meta node with the rounds connects to a concatenate node. So that is our final table where we can later on review exactly how every match in the term tournament went. We then go ahead and also write this into Excel. Okay, let's maybe try and close out this video by coming to a conclusion and reviewing the outcome of the analysis and who the winner may be. The last meta node is some data wrangling to yet create another network view on the development of the tournament in the main stage. I tried to find some other ways to visualize a tournament tree, however it turned out to be quite difficult. That's why in the end I decided to wrangle all the data and create an awesome network. In the end a tournament tree is just a bunch of nodes connected by edges as well. It's Saturday evening Central European time right now and I've just ran the workflow a final time. As always, the team managers had to nominate the final 26 players last night. What you're currently seeing is indeed the outcome of the analysis and the tournament simulation. For the network view of the tournament tree, as you can see, doesn't really look like a tree. However, I tried to add some features, for example, shape features and color features, to make it clear who is advancing and who's dropping out at the tournament. The winner, as you can see, is Germany, indicated by the yellow asterisk. If we work backward from that yellow note, we can see that Germany beat France in the final. Before that, Germany played Portugal and won in the semi-finals and played Spain and won in the quarterfinals. The first match in the main tournament round was against Denmark, which was won as well. Let's wrap up this video by putting the final outcomes of all matches on screen. I slowly scroll through as I talk about some of the constraints of this approach. Whereas it's been absolute a lot of fun to apply this methodology of graph theory to determine the outcome of a tournament. It also comes with the constraint that the methodology in which teams advance or do not advance is very simplistic. It's the team with the higher ranking always wins. Reality in a soccer tournament certainly looks different. However, all the outcomes are not too surprising. And as a German, I'm personally very happy with the predicted outcome. And I don't think it is too far fetched given that the tournament happens in Germany. So every single game will be a home team game. I also have to admit that the outcome changed several times while I was working on this video as the final teams got narrowed down and more and more players got kicked off the squads that were announced preliminary. This certainly has become one of my longest videos to date, so thank you very much if you stuck around until the end. All the links to the workflow and or to all the references that are made during the video you can find in the description below. Thank you very much and until next time.